to uh, welcome you this morning. Uh, glad that you are here. We've got a lot of folks out of town, but we've also got quite a few visiting. So if you're a guest, we want to offer a special welcome to you. Uh, we know there are many choices, and we're glad that you have chosen uh, to come together with us this morning as we worship the Lord. Uh, it's, a, it's a different Sunday morning, uh, so you're going to see some different folks up here. So this is usually Jody. You get me this morning. Uh, Lincoln is out of town, so uh, Cade Smith is leading our worship. Uh, Jody uh, already had vacation planned. Uh, you probably saw in the announcement that he uh, lost his father Thursday night. Uh, so they are in Atlanta right now. Uh, but Scott Sager from Lipscomb University, uh, who is the VP of church services there and a friend of Twickenham, uh, is here to speak to us this morning. I know that you will be uh, blessed by what he says. Another thing that we're going to do special this morning is to take up a contribution uh, for the victims of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, this came across my email earlier this week, and I just, uh, just absolutely incredible what happened uh, in Texas and Louisiana. Harvey was the strongest storm to hit Texas since the 1960s. Winds uh, at 132 miles an hour. Uh, some places almost 52 inches of rain. Estimated that the total amount of rainfall from Harvey, 20 trillion gallons. 20 trillion gallons. If it had been snow, it would have been the equivalent of nearly 210 inches or 17 and a half feet of snowfall. Uh, 30 to 40,000 homes destroyed in the Houston area alone. National Guard made 8,500 rescues, 26,000 evacuations. And as of last Thursday, there were 32,000 people in shelters. So just a lot going on down there. Our disaster relief team, in coordination with the PAR group, Prepare and Respond, uh, is coordinating three different trips. The first one, they will leave this Sunday. So later this morning, we will take a special contribution, and all the monies that are donated in that special contribution will be sent along with PAR as they go to that area to help with the recovery. So this morning, uh, and, and Cade will reintroduce this just so you know, we will take a contribution, which will be our regular contribution, then we will have communion, and then we will take a second contribution after that communion, and that will be the one to help with the Houston relief efforts. With that, if you will stand, let's open with a reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Son and Lord, we trust before him. Praise him, all ye sons of God. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.
We'll sing this next song as we take our normal offering. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. How can I forget His love? How can I forget His mercy? from the gospel according to John. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me has eternal life, and I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This is the bread, this bread is my flesh, which I give for the world, for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. I think this is a really powerful, powerful line Jesus gives, and can also be a little confusing. I want to hone in on his opening phrase. He says, very truly I tell you, anyone who believes in me has eternal life. So not too long ago, Ashley and I watched a documentary. I love documentaries. I don't know if any of you guys love documentaries. They're so informative. They can be a little scary, though, because you can learn a little bit too much. So the documentary we watched was on sugar, the beautiful sugar and its bad qualities. So be warned, I'll tell you, the documentary we saw was called Fed Up, and it doesn't give you the most positive reviews on sugar and it will transform your diet. And I tell you today, I believe sugar is not the best for me. That's just my own personal belief, and it comes a lot because of this documentary I saw. Um, now let's see here. So for those of you who don't know, I celebrated my birthday this past Monday, and Ashley made me this beautiful vanilla cake with this creamy frosting, lots of sugar, and I had a slice. I didn't have a small slice either. None of this joking around. It was my birthday. I was going to have a slice. Well, actually, I had two slices. <laughs> but it's my birthday, so that's okay. Okay, this is church. If I'm going to confess, let's be honest, 
I, I'll tell you the truth, most days I go to bed with at least one solid bowl of ice cream. And I think actually on average, once a week, maybe if not twice, I'll have two full bowls of ice cream. I just, so if I think about it, I believe sugar's bad for me, but maybe in actuality what I do has more to the record of what I truly believe, which is it's kind of bad for me in moderation sometimes. It's, it's tough to say what I truly believe. So here we come to this phrase, believe and you shall have eternal life. What we do here is an act of belief. Now, let's be honest, we don't believe we're eating God's, God's Jesus' flesh or drinking his blood. No, I you know, don't want to burst your bubble, but we buy it at Kroger. It's not uh, some special juice. We believe it means de depth beyond what we're doing here. Uh, another way I like to say it is we, what we believe is what we hope for. We hope that Christ can be within us, that he can remain in us. It's easy to do here in these walls, yes, but how much harder is it to do outside of these walls? When the marginalized need someone to stand up for, when there are orphans, widows, when the poor is at the street, do we believe Christ is within us then? Do we believe eternal life is here now? I like to believe so, but I love more, not that this is a command as much as a promise. Believe in me, do these acts, and eternal life will be within you. Or to put it another way, there was a man that came to Jesus and said, please help save my daughter. And Christ turned to him and said, do you believe? And he said, yes, Lord, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Let us hold on to that promise that we will have eternal life. We don't have to believe now as much as we take an act of belief. So let us take this communion as an act of belief that eternal life will be in, within us now or tomorrow or when Christ needs us most. Let us pray. Lord, may this body of yours be broken within us. May we die to our own ambitions so that we may share with the world your love. In Christ's name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all
pray for the cup. Holy Father, please help us in our unbelief. Strengthen us in this cup today so that we might believe in you when difficulty of loving our neighbor is before us. We love you, O Lord. And in your name we pray, amen. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the we'll take our special offering. Uh, I'm going to pray for that offering and then we'll have just a few moments of silence and I think it'll be beneficial if we're all praying for that effort. Pray for our car group going down there and then pray for the families. Um, but I think if we all focus on that right now, that would be good and then we'll, we'll sing a song after, after a few moments. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. Father, we are so grateful for all the blessings that you give us. Father, we recognize you as the creator. Father, we know that you were there in the beginning. Father, we know that you will be you, will be you forever. And God, sometimes we, we question things that happen here um, on this earth, on your earth. And Father, forgive us whenever we have our doubts. Father, help us to, as we take this offering, help us to remember those who have been affected by the storm. Father, help us to um, give with generous hearts. Father, help us to Remember those families and help them in any way that we can. Father, specifically as, as we're sending people down there, I pray that you would keep them safe.
And I pray that uh, the good that they would do would bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand for this song, please, before Scott brings our message this morning. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. Desperate 
to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with the Well, it's good to be with you. It's an honor to be here. I bring you greetings from Nashville. And Kate, I want to say, I don't think that the worship leading has ever sounded better. <laughs> be, be sure and tell Lincoln I said that, too, if you don't mind. Lincoln's a dear friend. We tease a lot. And it's uh, great to uh, be with Kate today and honored to be among you. I uh, wanted to also say thank you for the special contribution. Um, I'm from Texas. And my wife is from Portland, Texas, which is 12 miles from Corpus Christi, just across the bay. And both of her parents were uh, evacuated uh, during the hurricane. And my brother-in-law has a little fishing house. And I want to stress just barely above Shanty, this uh, fishing house. But it's in a town called Bayside. And he went by to see it the day before yesterday and said that for every house that's standing, there's 20 that are gone. And so the devastation throughout that region is beyond what we can really imagine. And it's really amazing for me because uh, I've got my son with me today. And we often go down and go fishing with my father-in-law. And the places that we go to fish, Ingleside, Bayside, Port Aransas, Aransas Pass... Uh, Rockport are decimated and so the help that we're able to give really is going to make a difference there and then of course with the huge flood in Houston and Port Arthur uh, this is just a really blessed time. I like to think about uh, your money going to help in Corpus Christi especially though because Corpus Christi means what? The body of Christ and so it's nice to think about the body of Christ being the body of Christ for the body of Christ. And what a blessing uh, that is. It's great to be with you all. I think this is one of my favorite churches anywhere, and it's always an honor to be with you. And today I want to talk to you uh, just a story about uh, the life of the Apostle John. And I've titled it, From Thunder to Wonder, From Lightning to Love. And uh, before I do that, I wanted to mention one thing. Be, beware of ministers that bring gifts, but I did uh, bring one here. It's another copy of the magazine, Intersections, which comes out from Lipscomb. This one's titled Rethinking Short-Term Missions. And uh, we take about over 800 students on mission trips every year. And so we've learned a lot about that, what we've done right and what we've done wrong. And every church does short-term missions, so there's a lot in here about how to rethink those to even do them better. And with the uh, tragedy in Texas, we're going to add four more mission trips this year. We'll be announcing those, and some of you may want to join us, but we'll be going fall break, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, and MLK weekend uh, to go down and to do some relief effort uh, for that. But pick up one of these if you'd like. It tells a lot about uh, missions. But let's pray, and we'll move into the message. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to be part of the body of Christ. Thank you for the love that you've lavished upon us, that we can be called your children. And we pause this morning to uh, just reflect upon all those who need you in a special way. From Jody, who's lost his father, to those in Texas, to those in Korea, to those in the Middle East, To those who are students, over 200,000, that are wondering about the DREAM Act and what will happen on Tuesday. Lord, we pray that you would be the God of all peace and comfort. That you would lavish those who need you most in your love. And that we might be conduits of that love to a world that so desperately needs it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, I've got a cultural uh, quiz to get us started today. Is that all right? I have a theory, by the way, young people, that this quiz is going to be won by your parents and not by you. You want to take me up on that bet that y'all know culture better than they do? Okay, let's give this a shot. I'm going to start a sentence, and if you know the rest of it, you just finish the sentence for me, okay? You ready? Two all beef patties special. What happened? <laughs> you want me to do that one more time? Just so y'all can... Two all beef patties special. Can you believe that your parents actually know culture? It's one of those scary moments. It's one of the few things that we still remember, isn't it? By the way, that's the recipe for a Big Mac. If you go to Big McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, what you're ordering is that. And we used to order those Big Macs a lot before we found out about fat grams and cholesterol. But I remember growing up and my dad was fascinated with the Big Mac because he wanted to know what's in the special sauce. My dad's an engineer. He belongs here in Huntsville. And, uh, but we, I grew up in Fort Worth. But he would, we'd go to McDonald's and he'd bring it home and... I mean, he'd get out the Thousand Islands. He was pretty convinced that there were Thousand Islands in it. He'd try to make that sauce. And it was so fascinating to ask, what's in the special sauce? And so this morning, I want to ask you the question, what's your special sauce? What makes you unique? What makes you different? What sets you apart from other people, individually, as a family, as a church? The temptation for us is to think that our special sauce is a program. It's our youth ministry, it's our children's ministry, it's our mission effort, it's our Christian school. But we often say that our special sauce is something that we do. And I want to argue this morning that what really is special sauce is who we are. And I want us to think that through and I want us to think back to the time when the Apostle John was walking the earth. The Apostle John, one of the 12 apostles, probably the apostle that walked most closely with Jesus. And let's picture him now as an old man, probably in his 80s. And he's been to the island of Patmos. He's been banished there. There's a cave that one day I'd love to take you to, where you could see where he lived on this cave. And and a rock that he used as a pillow, and a way that he would pull himself up. But his, his home base was 70 miles from Patmos in Turkey today, called Ephesus. And that's where he lived as an old man. And if we walked into Ephesus today, we'd come from the water, and we'd walk in along this beautiful cardo, and uh, there'd be this beautifully paved street, and if we looked straight ahead, there'd be this amazing coliseum that seated over 20,000 people. And you might remember that Paul and Artemis of the Ephesians in the book of Acts, there's this great conflict there. But as we're walking, if we could look over to our left would be the temple of Diana or Artemis. And it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world at that time. Just to put it in perspective, the temple was so big. How big was it, Scott? The temple was so big, it was bigger than a football field. It was over 100 yards long. It was over 40 yards wide, and the columns were 75 feet tall. And there it was. And as you could walk in today, I could take you to the home of John, where he took care of Mary in her old age. And I could also take you to the church of St. John. And if we could picture the old man John coming to that church, gathering with the people of God, they would always ask him to speak, tell us stories about Jesus. But as he got to the end of his life, they'd say, talk to us, tell us. And the one thing he would always say was this, little children love one another. Can you say that with me? Little children love one another one another. I want to ask, was that because John was one of those guys that 
love to sit around in a circle and hold hands and sing kumbaya? Is that why he said that? Well, let's back up for just a moment and let's go back to when he was a boy. Let's go back to Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. We walk into that village today and I could show you a pillar that's carved and it has the name Zebedee in it. It says this pillar was given, dedicated to the family of Zebedee and it sits even today in Capernaum. I could take you to the synagogue there where James and John and Peter and Andrew probably met Jesus for the first time. The, the synagogue still stands, and you could go and you could sit in the exact places where John and his family sat. I could show you where Peter's home was, where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. But it's down at the water's edge that I want us to go. Picture James and John in their little boats, boats that were smaller than this stage. And they'd fish for tilapia every night. And they come in from fishing one day and they're mending their nets. And Jesus comes up to them and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they leave their dad with the hired men in the boat and they begin to follow Jesus. And my question is, did Jesus know what he was getting into with those two guys? Did he do a personality test, a disc inventory? Did he take them on a ropes course and see how the team was going to work? If you look in Mark chapter 3, it lists Jesus' 12 band of brothers that are going to follow him for the next three years. And three of them get nicknames. Peter gets the nickname Rocky. And James and John get the nickname Boarnages. Boarnages which means sons of thunder. When Jesus met these two, he thought, those are hotheads. I mean, you put John on a camel, and you've got road rage. You put John behind a microphone, and you've got a shock jock. You put him in a boat, he was at home in a boat, but I bet he cussed like a sailor. If you gave him a cell phone, can you imagine what he'd tweet? Maybe you can. But John was a thunderous guy. And Jesus said, come and follow me. And so John began to follow Jesus and to see how he treated people and to see how he acted. The worst moment in John's life happens in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, it tells us that they were up by the Sea of Galilee and they decided that they needed to go to Jerusalem. And so there were two ways to go. You could take the scenic way, Route 66, around the Jordan, through Jordan, and then come back in. Or you could take the interstate, straight through a place called Samaria. Samaria was a group of people that were half-breeds. They were Jews that had married outside of Israel. And the Jews held them in great contempt. Didn't like them at all. If you're an Auburn fan, think Alabama. If you're an Alabama fan, think Auburn. And then it's even worse, okay? That's what they thought of Samaritans. And as they're traveling through Samaria, headed to Jerusalem... They stop in a village to get some food to eat, and the people won't feed them because they're headed to Jerusalem. And the Samaritans believed that the right place to worship God was on Mount Ebal in the middle of Samaria. And it's interesting. Today, there are still about 700 Samaritans left in the world. And they still keep Passover, and they still offer sacrifices, and they still live in that little area around Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. But they wouldn't feed Jesus and his band because they were headed to Jerusalem where they argued was the true place to worship God. And so when John found out that they were going to withhold food from them, he got so mad. He got so mad he turned to Jesus and he said, Jesus, 
Just let me call down fire from heaven and let's consume them all. Jesus looked at him. What happened? Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Kim Jong, Attila the Hun, John. The only thing between John and genocide was Jesus. That's how great the hate was in his heart. But what's interesting about Jesus is that from that point on, he didn't push John away. He did exactly the opposite. He pulled him closer. He pulled him even closer. You find John is one of the big three that are going places that others don't go. He's getting a bird's eye view. He's getting to see things that others aren't getting to see. It's like Jesus says, you need more of me and I want to be with you. And he just pulls Jesus clo- uh, John close. And John begins to see the way Jesus treats people. The way Jesus responds. The way Jesus acts. So now it's the last week of Jesus' life. They're in Jerusalem. He's headed to the cross. And we find James and John coming to Jesus with their mother, the great lobbyist. Jesus, we know you're about to set up a kingdom, and when you do, what we would really like is for one of us to sit on your right and one of us to sit on your left. Vice President, Secretary of State. Can you do that for us? Jesus looked at him and said, Who will be on my right and who will be on my left? That's up to God. I can't give you those ones. But follow me. It then says that the other apostles found out about this little power play. And they were indignant. You know the feeling when you find out that some parent has gone around you and is trying to get the best places for their kids. You know how you feel? That's the way the apostles felt. And they were indignant and angry. And so Jesus called everybody to him and he said, hey guys, listen up. Listen. The, the, Jew, the, the Gentiles and the rulers that are pagan... They lord it over others. They exercise authority. They go for power, but not so with you. Whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So now it's Thursday night. And Jesus wants to celebrate Passover with his disciples. So they go to this beautiful, ornate upper room, still there in Jerusalem today. And they walked up the stairs to the second floor, and as they walked into this upper room, here's this beautiful banquet that's been set up. But right over here, you know what there is? You can see it just out of the corner of your eye. There's a stool and a towel and a bucket. But there's no servant sitting there. And so as every apostle walks in, they've got this moment where they've got to decide, what do I do? Do I stop and wash my feet? I've been walking through the streets all day. My feet stink. And by the way, they ate laying down on their left elbow with their feet right behind the person behind them. So it wasn't going to be a luxurious meal If they didn't wash. But they were all afraid to lose a spot, a good seat at the table. You know how it is when it's cafeteria time and you don't want to be somebody that gets stuck not having a seat at the table? And so you make a beeline for your seat. And nobody washes their feet. So about a quarter of the way through the meal, Jesus gets up, stretches. The next thing they know, he's over here. Stripped down to his boxers. And he's putting the towel around his waist. 
And then he goes to the table and starts at one end and begins to wash everybody's feet. Peter argues, you can't wash mine. And Jesus says, oh, yes, I can, or you can't be a part. But picture him washing the feet of Judas, who in just a few minutes will walk out of the room and go and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And he washes his feet and makes his way around, comes back, puts back on his clothes, and sits down at the head of the table. And then he asked, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you're right. I am. Now, if I, your teacher and your Lord, have washed your feet, I've done it as an example so that you might wash each other's feet. Now that you know what you ought to do, you'll be blessed if you do it. And then he said these words. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. Everyone will know you're my disciple by the way that you love one another. Best we can tell, the only apostle at the cross was John. And he saw the way Jesus forgave those who mistreated him. How he blessed a thief who had earlier been taunting him. How he took care of his mother how he lavished everyone he could find, even at the cross, in love. John was right there sitting next to Peter a few days later after the resurrection when they had gone fishing. And Jesus had cooked breakfast and invited them in from the boat. And do you remember Jesus calling Peter to come and sit next to him? Peter, who had denied Jesus three times just a few days earlier, now three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And John watched as Jesus bear hugs Peter and welcomes him back as his brother. So John's the old man now. And the years have gone by. And all the other apostles are dead. And John is so weak, he can't even walk to that church in Ephesus anymore. They pick him up and they carry him. And people come from all over the region because John's going to speak one last time. The church tradition tells us that they gathered from all over. Speak to us, and he said these words. Little children, love one another. Isn't there any more? Isn't there something else you want to say? Little children, love one another. This is the Lord's command. And if you do it, it will be enough. From thunder to wonder, from lightning to love. How many of us are known for our thunder? Our angry response. For the way that things seem to get the best of us. And have you noticed that we seem to get most upset with others about the things that we dislike about ourselves? First John chapter 3, Jesus tells us how great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we might be called the children of God. That is who we are. You're a child of God. God loves you 
that much. He's lavished his love upon you that you might be called his child. In verse 16 of chapter 3, he goes on to say that if you have the world's possessions and you see your brothers in Corpus and Houston in need, you give. Just like you've done today. You show your love not just by your words, but by your deeds and by your actions. But it's in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, that I want to just show you one last thing. Because John has these words. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love, listen, whoever doesn't love doesn't know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So this is love. Not that we loved God. But that he first loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our friends, so, for our sins. So dear friends... Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The greatest truth in all the world is God loves us. Jesus was sent to prove it, and the Holy Spirit has been left to remind us Again and again and again. How deeply we are loved. And we show that we get it by the way that we love others. Are you thunder today? Ask Jesus to pull you closer. Take another look at the Gospels. And pull yourself closer to Jesus and ask, how can I model his life? How can I be more like him? How can I understand his love and live in that more intentionally? From lightning to love. Hurt people hurt people. Healed people love people. If you find that you are quick to throw lightning bolts, ask God to heal your heart. St. Augustine said, love God and do as you will. Anything that springs forth from love will be a blessing. Tertullian said, it was the love of the church that so amazed those who were trying to destroy it. And so, I close by just telling you two things. One is that uh, a few years ago, I did an interim at a church, Madison Church of Christ in Nashville area. And they had a famous minister years and years ago when I was a young boy. His name was Ira North. And my dad had given me a book by Ira North. And it said two things that were really important It said, you should always maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And it said, in church, everyone should get their say, but no one should get their way all the time. And so when I went to visit that church, I said, yeah, I've read this book about Ira, and I know these two things, unity of the Spirit, bond of peace. Everyone gets their say, but no one gets their way all the time. And the guy who was the executive minister, the associate minister for Ira for all those years was still there. And he looked up at me and he said, yeah, but that wasn't the secret to the Madison church. 
And I said, really? He said, yeah. The secret? You don't know the secret? He said, the secret of the Madison Church was that every Sunday, Ira would stand up and say, at the Madison Church, there's more love per square inch than anywhere else on earth. There's more love per square inch than anywhere else on earth. That was the secret sauce. That was what made them different. And I know that there's a world that's just desperately looking for a place that loves them where they are, but too much to leave them there that wants them to look more like Jesus. And so let's not be people that think that being more loving means being more weak, being more liberal, being more whatever it might be. Let's make being more loving the secret sauce that draws us closer to Christ and gives us a better witness to a world that so desperately needs it. The great theologian, Whitney Houston, said it this way. You can have diamonds in your hands, have all the riches in the land, but without love, you don't really have a thing. When somebody cares that you're alive, when somebody trusts you with their life, that's when you'll know that you have all you need. You'll hold the world's most priceless gift, the finest treasure that there is. You can look back and know you were loved. You were loved by someone, touched by someone, held by someone, meant something to somebody. Love somebody, touch somebody's heart along the way. Then you can look back and say, you were loved. God loves you. Jesus shows us how much. The Holy Spirit was left to remind us again and again and again that we're loved. And we are more like Christ when we are loving other people than when we do anything else. So let's make it the secret sauce that makes our life different. And if we can introduce you to that life today or if you want us to pray about your thunder or anything else that we can do to minister to you, that's why we're here. And if we can bless you in any way, we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of Scott, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, I picked up a copy of Intersection, was reading it during your lesson. There's some really good stuff in here. 
Uh, I am kidding. Um, please pick up one of these. Always some great articles uh, in those. And Will, thank you for being here with us this morning also. Glad you're able to join your dad. Kay, thank you so much uh, for leading worship this morning. Just a few announcements before we uh, dismiss. Uh, Joel and Sarah Thompson uh, have visited with us on several occasions. Uh, I was told yesterday morning they had a little baby girl, Amity Salah. So keep them in your prayers as they welcome that new baby into the world. The Twickenham Children's Ministry service day is this Saturday, September 9th. Uh, there's details in your bulletin about that for all the Twickenham Children Ministry families. Uh, come join with us as we put our love into action. Small groups will be starting up later this month. Uh, we're working together and getting that small group directories done and ready and out by next Sunday. Uh, if you're interested in hosting a group, leading a group, please give me a call, shoot me an email uh, as we continue to put that together. Men's Retreat is coming up September 22nd through 24th. Uh, if you have not registered, uh, we're asking to try to get as many of those in by today as we can. Uh, we've got some counts that we need to provide, especially related to the ropes course. So if you're going to come to that, uh, if you could fill out one of those forms on your way out uh, and turn those in, or if you get home and decide you want to come, if you could shoot me an email as uh, we'll send those counts in later this week. There is a fundraising dinner for Her Voice um, featuring Saran Stacy here at Twickenham this Thursday night. If you're interested in purchasing tickets or sponsoring a table, you can contact Sandra Law. And finally, the office will be closed tomorrow for Labor Day, uh, and we'll be back in the office on Tuesday. Kay's going to lead us in one more song, and then we'll have our closing prayer. I uh, hope you have a great week. Let's stand, please. thankful for the blessings we've received from being here today. We're thankful for Scott and for the message he brought to us, and we're thankful for his ability and his service to you. God, we know that you are aware of every problem, that's, every struggle that's being faced by the people in Texas and Oklahoma or in uh, 
Louisiana. And God, we pray your blessings upon them. God, we know that you're aware of the pain and sorrow that's being faced by Jody and Lisa and their family today. And we know that you're aware of the struggles of every person in this audience. And God, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that we can trust in you to heal our sorrows. And we're thankful, God, that we can always know that from every struggle, eventually there's a blessing. And we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for blessing us. We ask you to be with us and help us to be your servants this week. In Jesus' name, amen.